Who would have thought 27 years ago, when first timid steps were made to find common ground for cooperation, or even 23 years ago, when we all knew already a bit better and the German government and the GIZ felt comfortable enough to declare during a conference in Bremen that they considered legal and judicial reform a long-term engagement necessitating continuous and long-term financing effort, that indeed the multifaceted programs and projects to put these reforms into practice would only end in 2020, with many actors and observers on all sides expressing serious concerns that the closing might come too early. Further, who would have thought 27 years ago that this conference closing was planned to take place in one of the many posh and elegant hotels in Tbilisi, a dynamic, rich, confident, and beautiful city, and that it could have taken place, in, if not blocked for political reasons, in one of the many posh and elegant hotels in Baku or Yerevan, both equally highly attractive cities, where 27 years ago there was misery, depression, power cuts, and water shortage. I recall that we drafted the Georgian Civil Code closed in winter coats and shawls. It goes without saying that I'm happy, honored, and flattered that you chose me to give this address. I do it with all the more pleasure and satisfaction since I can testify without a shred of doubt that in all three countries of the Caucasus, the economic and social progress has been remarkable, incredible, and unforeseeable. I do not want to say that everything is fine, that social and economic inequality and poverty are not longer an issue, and that anybody should be satisfied with a situation where a military conflict is looming as an open wound, hindering sustainable development in the region and, and a complete regional approach to cooperation. What I want to say, however, is that an observer who has come here for the first time 27 years ago and comes back now to compare the three countries cannot but state that the hopelessness, the misery, the lack of private perspective for a good life and the lack of public infrastructure without which no society can prosper, that all this has been overcome. It would certainly be preposterous to claim that all this is owed to legal and judicial reform. However, I do find a lot of truth in the conclusions of Nobel Prize laureate Douglas North's research on economic history that, and I quote, the inability of societies to develop cost-effective, low-cost enforcement of contracts is the most important source of both historical stagnation and contemporary underdevelopment in the third world. Systematic codification, as created in the Caucasus, is a public good, freely available to everybody, fostering certainty and trust, and thus reducing transaction costs. And the administration of justice is part of social infrastructure. It is an element of a cost-efficient justice when, as firmly established in Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia, the sovereign rights and obligation of the state administrations are clearly and transparently defined in public law, when formal title to property of movable and immovable assets, as well as other jura in rem, are clearly defined rights and obligations in contractual relations are firmly established in private law, and when procedural law guarantees access to justice to every citizen. It came as no surprise when, in the wake of unsuccessful structural adjustment programs and shock therapies of privatization, the World Bank confirmed in its World Development Report of 2017 that empirical studies have revealed the importance of law and legal institutions of improve, to improving the functioning of specific institutions enhancing growth, promoting secure property rights, improving access to credit, and delivering justice in society." Quote end. The assumption is evidenced by empirical data on the expenditure by private persons for ju judicial and legal services in common law and in civil law jurisdictions. It is well documented that in, that in your, the, jurisdictions with a systematic codified law, expenditure is less than half or even one-sixth if compared to the United Kingdom, to Ireland, or the United States. Inevitably, such a statement will provoke issues of legitimacy of legal reform cooperation. One school of legal thought asserts that all legal transplants are doomed to fail since they underestimate and violate the specificity of legal national cultures, its Germanness, Englishness, 
Armenianness, Azerbaijanness, or Georgianness. Further, in a widely read study of 2019, Krastev and Holmes opine that the imposition and imitation of so-called Western normative concepts of democracy and the rule of law have led countries like Hungary, Poland, and Russia to a nationalistic populism as backlash and rejection of imitation. We have consistently tried to dissipate such doubts and attacks. Most importantly though, the history of the Caucasus has always been part of the history of the Mediterranean and of Europe. We do not need to go back to Gekhard and the Golden Fleece and the Georgian Code of Wachtank of 1723, which builds explicitly on Armenian, Christian and European law and to German immigration to Azerbaijan, Armenia and Georgia as from the 18th century to understand the closeness of cultural relations and cross fructifications between the Caucasus, Germany and Europe. We are also entitled to refer to the Russian and then Soviet legal traditions, which were deeply influenced by continental European law, despite all ideological aberrations. Indeed, there has not been an imposition or imitation of German and European law in the Caucasus. During the reference conference in Bremen in 1997, all participating states and organizations agreed in unanimous conclusions of Bremen, and I quote, that a coherent legal system, the implementation of which is guaranteed by the state is a fundamental and indispensable prerequisite of democracy and market economy, quote end. It fits to this general observation that whenever results of our cooperation came under attack, such as the civil code in Georgia some 15 years ago, or parts of the civil court in Azerbaijan, the attack was not motivated by an alleged Azerbaijani or Georgian identity, but by the wish to imitate the USA. We learned early on that the drafting of one or the other piece of legislation was not an appropriate answer to the enormity of the transition in the post-Soviet societies. The drafting of the constitution, the law on entrepreneurs or the civil code engendered the necessity to engage in the creation of procedural enforcement in insolvency codes, which in turn engendered the recreation of the organization of courts and other legal professions, from lawyers via notaries to bailiffs, which in turn engendered the necessity to provide for training, for the creation of forms to facilitate the professional activities, for the publication of texts and court decisions, but also of training material and legal literature and for the modernization of university curricula. One of the intended characteristics of the program was the stability of the personnel. Only three persons, Zeno Reichenbecher, Thomas Meyer, and I, have headed the program during almost three decades. And Vartan Porosian remained the pillar of stability in Armenia, while Lado Chanturia, Zulkan Gamkhelidze, and Chalva Papuashvili secured continuity in Georgia and Aydin, Suleiman Lee, and El Chinusu did the same in Azerbaijan. Codes, laws, and statutes were drafted. Despite slightly different speed and priorities, we can state today that the three countries have enacted modern legislation for the core areas of private and public law. They are substantially comparable, similar, and compatible. That does not mean that drafting effort can stop. It is a never ending exercise, especially acute in countries which have emerged from a long Soviet period. As examples, the project continues until now to support the reform of company law in Azerbaijan and Georgia and the drafting of amendments to the civil code in all three countries. As to training, in all countries, continuous efforts were undertaken to secure training of all professionals on all levels. As to university teaching, I want to refer to a casebook and solutions in civil law, which I have written together with a group of Armenian scholars and a group of Azerbaijani scholars and practitioners to present the technique of deciding and motivating decisions in civil law disputes, one in accordance with Armenian and the other one in accordance with Azerbaijani law. Finally, I want to mention scientific literature in the form of a commentary to the Armenian constitution and to the Georgian civil code. Although these activities come to an end in the present setting, I refuse to qualify my words as a type of necrology. Why? Because I firmly believe that the Caucasian-German cooperation for legal and judicial reforms will change its structure, but will continue under different forms. The basis for this belief is my conviction that the corpus 
of codified law has reached a degree of maturity and the institutions practicing law in one way or another, the state administration, the judiciary, the law faculties, and the professional associations have reached a degree of professional competence and sophistication that new forms of cooperation will emerge at eye level. I want to give some examples. First, the commentaries and case books I have mentioned have been supported by GIZ, but much of the input in substance has been contributed by Armenian, Azerbaijani, and Georgian authors. Nothing hinders them to make this their own profitable affair, as it is in Germany and other countries, and continue publishing new editions which can be sold on the market. Second, the GIZ has not, not turned its back to law. The new program, which is headed by Christoph Bayer, will certainly concentrate on local government, but has a heavy component of a regulatory policy is unavoidable. Third, in his recent article, Die Ausdehnung des Europäischen Privatrechts, Laudo Chanturia has correctly pointed out that the association agreement between Georgia and the EU will intensify the process of Europeanization of your Georgian law, which has started in the 1990s with the GIZ project. Without wanting to be political, I assume that both Armenia and Azerbaijan will continue their assimilation into the European legal system. This opens a great opportunity and necessity of cooperation between the EU and its member states on the one hand, and the Caucasian states on the other, where German experts, thanks to the tradition of cooperation established by the GIZ project, are well placed today to play an important role. Fourth, the membership of the Caucasian states in the Council of Europe the European Court of Human Rights and the Venice Commission is a powerful long-term basis and instrument for a continuous dialogue and cooperation in the spheres of constitutional but also of administrative law. Fifth, all Caucasian states are mem also members of the International Association of Judges and Armenia and Georgia are members of the International Union of Notaries with Azerbaijan being close to membership. This leads to an intensive exchange and cooperation on issues of the role and the law of the professions. Sixth, at a different level from the cooperation of professional associations, I know of sometimes informal and sometimes formalized cooperation between German courts and courts of the Caucasian states. Much more could be said because the topic is so rich, our collective experience is so diversified and legal and judicial reform is a never-ending story in all countries of the world. However, I must end here and close my remarks by confessing an enormous sentiment of privilege, satisfaction, pride, and humility to have been part of these incredible developments and adventures. Danke.